Hi hey friends, welcome back to our study. We're going to jump in here. We're going to do uh, Romans chapter 2. So having discussed the many sins that the Gentile world is embracing, that in rejecting God, rejecting the truth, going after the lust of their own heart, denying God's obvious existence, His creation, the things of God that can be known, and God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And they enter and engage in all, to, all uh, forms of sin. So we're going to go on into Romans 2 now where Paul is going to lay the argument that not only are the Gentiles under the wrath of God, but also the Jews. So let's go ahead and read it. I've got it up here on the screen for you. Romans to one. Therefore thou art excusable, O man, whosoever thou art, that thou judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, or despisest? Thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Okay, so... The design of this chapter of Paul is to show that the Jews were no less guilty than the Gentiles and that they also needed the benefit of salvation. Many of them didn't believe that. He does this by showing that the Jews had greater light than the Gentiles, which we've been discussing in the, in the first chapter. Uh, so they had greater light and were going to be held more accountable, but still... That even though they had this light, they were disobeying the light that they had. And they had the habit of accusing and condemning the Gentiles as wicked and abandoned. So the, in the Jewish mindset, they were wicked, they were abandoned by God. However, they excused themselves on the ground that they possessed the law and the oracles of God and were his favorite people. So the Apostle Paul here is affirming that they were inexcusable in their sins we see in this first verse of chapter 2 that they must be condemned in the sight of God on the same ground on which they had condemned the Gentiles they had light and yet they committed wickedness so in when we read in Romans 1 20 that the Gentiles were without excuse and let me pull that up so if the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even as eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse so even if the the Gentiles were are without excuse not having received the law much more would the Jew much more would the Jew so and who condemned them Paul was condemning them because they were without excuse on the same grounds as a Gentile so the word therefore gets a lot of uh, uh, has a lot of force. It's been the subject of much discussion over the years. And the word therefore refers not to any particular word in the previous chapter or to any particular verse, but to the general considerations which, which were suggested by a view of the whole case. So he's, he's leading in now, having laid the foundation in chapter 1 for the Gentiles, now he's leading in based on that. Now we're going to get into the Jews and those who claim to be uh, uh, living higher and in, in greater mindset than, the, than the, the ungodly Gentiles, how they are going to be without excuse also. And uh, let's see, since 
You Jews condemn the Gentiles for their sins on the ground that they have the means of knowing their duty. Therefore, you who are far more favored than they are entirely without an excuse for the same thing. So that's what we're saying here. He says, Thou art inexcusable. And this expression, Thou art in inexcusable, this does not mean that they were inexcusable for judging others, but that they had no excuse for their sins before God, or that they were under condemnation for their crimes and needed the benefits of another plan of justification. So uh, they need the justification just like the Gentiles do. Another plan, that they were, they were in their sin, uh, having violated the law and the light that they had been given. So as the Gentiles whom they judge were condemned and, with, and were without excuse in Romans 1.20, so were the Jews who condemned them without ex excuse on the same principle and in a still greater degree. He says, O oh man, in this verse also. And this address is general to any man who should do this. But it is plain from the connection that he means especially the Jews. So the use of this word is an instance of the apostle's skill in argument. If he had openly named the Jews here, it would have been likely to have excited opposition from them. He therefore approaches the subject gently or gradually, affirms it of man in general, so he's saying, O man, and then makes a particular application to the Jews. And we're going to see that. This he does not do, however, until he has advanced so far in the principles of this argument and the generality of it that it would be impossible for them to evade the conclusions. So he kind of lays the groundwork and then, and then uh, the Jews are obvious to see that it applies to them. But he is tender, he's kind in the way that he does it and in a convincing manner. And we're going to see in Romans uh, 2.17, which I'll show you, where he says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. So he's going to get, down in, get into this later on in the chapter we're going to see. So let's go back. And uh, he says, Whosoever thou art that judgest, the word judgest is krinius, K-R-I-N-E-I-S in the Greek. Krinius here is used in the sense of condemning. It's not a word of equal strength with, with what is rendered condemnest. It implies, however, that they were accustomed to express themselves freely and severely of the character and doom of the Gentiles. So, uh, and then and from the New Testament, as well as from the other their other writings, there can be no doubt that such was the fact, and that they regarded the entire Gentile, Gentile world with abhorrence, considering them as shut out from the favor of God, and applied to them terms expressive of this utmost contempt. So we see in Matthew 15.27, which is another verse I'll share here, which uses the same word. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. So I believe this is the, in reference to the Syrophoenician woman who came, who had a daughter who was possessed by a devil, and she was begging Jesus for deliverance from this. And Jesus said, Is it not meat or fitting to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yeah, I'm a dog. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And I don't think she, you know, this was not Jesus calling her a dog. It was more uh, in reference to the, the disciples that were with him who were looking down on her being a woman and a Gentile woman. And yet Jesus was willing, was talking to her when they came upon this situation. So Jesus was just exposing the hearts of his disciples, thinking that she was a dog. They're thinking, yeah, right, Jesus, give it to her. She is a dog. And yet this woman shows extreme faith, and the Lord answers her prayer and delivers her daughter. It says her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So this is the the way in which... Uh, the way in which this word, which we're back here in, uh, sorry, hold on. So it just shows the Jewish mindset. They're judging the Gentile world. They abhor them. They think they're the special ones in favor with God. And this Syrophoenician woman comes and 
and Jesus shows her favor. Uh, but she's even considering herself to be a dog in their sight because that's how the Jews looked on them. So this was uh, a judgment that could be felt in Jesus' day by the, the non-Jewish people. So he, Paul is addressing whosoever that thou are that judges for wherein or in the same thing. This implies that substantially the same crimes which were committed among the, pagan, the pagans were also committed among the Jews. Thou judgest another. The meaning of this clearly is for the same thing for which you condemn the, the pagan or the non-believer, the non-Jew. You condemn yourselves. Thou that judgest, uh, you Jews who condemn other nations, you doest the same things, which is clearly implied here. That they were guilty of offenses similar to those practiced by the Gentiles, it would not be a just principle of interpretation to press this declaration as implying that precisely the same offenses and to the same extent were changed chargeable on them. So in the, in the time of, uh, of Paul, the nation was not necessarily guilty of idolatry like other nations might be, or uh, the same crimes that were committed in Romans chapter 1 where they were given over to idolatry and this reprobate mind, the Jews may not be able to, to line up with that. But the character of the nation, as given in the New Testament, is that they were an evil and an adulterous generation. And I've got some scriptures to back that up. So Jesus in Matthew 12:39 says, He answered them and says, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and now shall there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So the Jews wanted a sign from Jesus. Prove to us that you're the Messiah. Prove to us that... You are the Son of God. And Jesus said that uh, the, the sign of this, uh, the only sign that would be given them was that of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in the whale, whale's belly for three days and three nights, so would Jesus be in the uh, heart of the earth, in the tomb for three days and three nights. Here is John 8, verse 7. So this is the confrontation with the Jews who caught the woman in the act of adultery brings this woman before Jesus and tempts Jesus. So they were just looking to find something to accuse Jesus with. And he, you know, they said that this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says that she should be stoned. What sayest you? Jesus bends down. He writes in the sand. He looks back up and he says, He who is without, without uh, sin, let him cast the first stone. And uh, they all flee or they... Uh, it says their consciences condemn them. Yeah, it says their consciences condemn them. And uh, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So these guys couldn't throw any stones. They were guilty of the same sin, probably perhaps with the same woman. But, uh, you know, and they were being hypocrites because why didn't they bring the man with them? The man and the woman were to be stoned. And if she was caught in the very act, obviously there was someone else involved. So uh, these guys, their consciences convicted them, and they dropped their stones. Next uh, verse I want to bring out, Jesus says, you know, to prove you do us the same things, is Matthew 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee? From the wrath to come. Again, Matthew 12, 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Matthew 12, 45. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So relating to when a demon leaves a man and then goes out, comes back, finds the house clean, the person is clean, hasn't uh, put in the Holy Spirit of God, hasn't been born again. So he takes back up residence and is the previous person because this person is still engaged in, in has a tendency to sin and give in to the lust of the flesh. Brings seven other spirits with himself. He compares that to the Jews. The Jews are here with the Messiah in front of them 
to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We know this is the goal of uh, the new birth, and they're rejecting him. So the house is swept clean, but there's no there. You know, these spirits come back and they say, "Well, if they want to be religious hypocrites, then so be it." And they're the worst state of that nation, or the the second state of that nation after rejecting Messiah. Jesus as their Messiah is worse. Mark 8.38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So this generation that Jesus is witnessing to is a an adulterous and sinful generation. And adulterous meaning committing adultery against the Heavenly Father, the God of Israel, going after their sin, going after their wickedness and evil practices. So we see through these verses that they were proud, they were haughty, they were hypocritical. Uh, in Matthew 23 is also more on the matter of their hypocrisy and the seven woes that Jesus pronounces on the Jews, the Pharisees, the, re the rejectors of God's mercy. Uh, well, not all Jews, I'm saying the, the hypocrites, the many that didn't receive him. So if such, if this was the character of the Jewish nation in general, there is no improbability of supposing that they practiced most of the crimes specified in Romans 1. And also, just to remark on a couple of things, they, are, they are, were people that were prone to, the, to be severe judges of others. And this is often perhaps commonly done when the accusers themselves are guilty of the same offenses. So just as we saw in John chapter 8, that they were willing to cast stones and show that they outwardly were trying to keep the law of Moses and you know kill, have this woman put to death for adultery when convicted in their own conscience. When Jesus shown the light of conviction in their own hearts, they realized were guilty of the same thing. So here is that uh, section out of the scripture, John 8, 1 through 11. And, you know, we already, we already touched on this. They're bringing him, they were doing it as a, a tempting in verse 6, that they might accuse him, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that was without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he again stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then we see in verse 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where art thou thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? So, you know, we can stop right there. And many, many sinners like to hold on to this portion of scripture and say, Well, you know, Jesus didn't condemn this woman caught in the act of adultery. So he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Uh, but Jesus also said that, you know, the world was already condemned because they rejected his word. And it says here in verse 11, she said, No man is, is uh, condemned me, Lord. And, you know, Jesus could have condemned her. He's the Son of God. He was without sin. He could have had the stones to throw himself. He was the one who gave the law on Mount Sinai. And yet, uh, he wanted to show mercy. You could see this woman was obviously repentant. And, but Jesus didn't leave it there. He says unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. It's not that time for her. You know, the Lord is long-suffering with us. He desires to show mercy and repentance. But look what he says. He says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So he's not condoning the woman's sin. Repent of your sin. I see that you're repentant. I'm here to show you mercy. I don't want you to end this way in your life. I don't want you to end in hell because of your sin. I want you to have life. But go and sin no more. Don't do this anymore. And... Uh, so I just wanted to end with that. So another quick reference to this of somebody being hard against a sin in the Jewish nation uh, who commits a sin himself. Here's David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. So David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's 
uh, Uriah the Hittite's wife, and he got her pregnant and uh, had Uriah sent into battle by his general Joab. Joab sent him, you know, sent a letter. David sent a letter to Joab, said, send Uriah the Hittite into the battle and then pull away from him. And basically he was killed at uh, David's order, hiddenly, secretly, because David was trying to hide the fact that he had gotten his wife Bathsheba pregnant. And he was trying to cover his sin. And But the Lord saw it. So, you know, David tried to, on the outwards, look all good and took Bathsheba to a wife for himself after uh, Uriah died. Um, but God saw the sin and he sent his man Nathan, the prophet, to confront David. So Nathan does this very subtly and gives him a parable that a, uh, that a rich man... There was a, two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him. And with his children it did eat of his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. So this very special lamb in the family. Nathan's laying out this story before David, because David needs to make a judgment. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Dressing meaning he killed it and had it made into a meal, lamb chops. Instead of the king, instead of this rich man taking from the abundance of his herds for his guest in making a meal of one of his of his flock, he takes this other man's special ewe lamb and kills it. And David, you know, not realizing it's in reference to him and his sin, he makes the judgment and he says, His anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, So David's in a position of judgment. And he's angry. How could, how could anyone do this? And he says to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. I'm so angry at this, this man deserves sin, or deserves death. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. You know, so David's showing how angry he is. And then Nathan turns to him and says to David, Thou art the man. You are the one, David. It's you. You're the guilty one. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. So now God is speaking. Basically said he's, he's not going to die, but he did have to restore the fourfold. The judgment was uh, put on to David. He, he lost four of his sons, by the way, and almost lost his kingdom. So that's a, that's a longer story. But here David, he's willing to have this man put to death. For the same sin he committed, but worse, it wasn't a lamb, it was Uriah's wife. So Uriah had one wife, David had multiple wives and concubines. And so David decides to take, lusts after Uriah's wife and takes her, you know, this, and Uriah has this one wife and he's this faithful man, uh, soldier serving in David's army, and David has him murdered and takes Bathsheba to wife. So this confronts David, um, so we can see how strongly uh, people can be to cover their own sin when they're guilty of the same. And here's a man in authority who's willing to have the man put to death, but yet the, the king himself is guilty of the same thing. So I, I said all that to say that you know they can have a remarkable zeal against sin, but it's no proof of a man's innocence. You know, compare this verse, Matthew 7, 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Hear Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So, Jesus is not uh, condemning judgment. He's condemning hypocritical judgment. And here, you know, David was being a hypocrite. These Pharisees in John chapter 8 were being hypocrites. They were being pretenders, phony, fakes. And they had this tremendous zeal. 
They had this tremendous zeal as being adherents to the law of God, but yet in their own heart they practiced the same thing. And these pretended reformers may be far, it's, it's not a proof that they are free from the very offenses that they are condemning others for. So when you judge, you have to judge righteous judgment. So you have to get the log out of your own eye before you can judge the speck in your brother's eye. So the hypocrite tries to conceal this, uh, but a man of truth will get the log out of his own eye, and then he can judge righteous judgment. So, uh, so when we judge others, we have to we have to examine our own heart before we make a judgment and make sure that uh, you know. We're not being hypocrites when we do this, and the self-examination might greatly mitigate the severity of our judgment. So it it softens us. We still want to judge, be on the side of truth, but it also makes sure that we get the log out of our own eye, and uh, and it might lessen a little bit of the indignation against others when we see that uh, we have need of help ourselves. So why don't we end there, my friends? It's been uh, getting close to 30 minutes. I, I want to try and keep them relatively uh, 30 minutes or less, and uh, we'll pick it up from there. Again, we want to lay the right groundwork here as we get into Romans chapter 2. So we'll see you next time.